All of us are feeling the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic is comparable to the storm that has swept the world. But while we might all be facing the same storm, we're all in different boats. This week, we're going to take a closer look at the impact of the pandemic on work and poverty in the U.S. First, let's talk about unemployment. Many of us have either been affected directly by job loss during the pandemic or know people who have. In May 2020, nearly 50 million people reported that they had been out of work at some point in the previous month because their place of work had closed or lost business because of the pandemic. Nearly 10 million more people reported that they'd left the labor force because the pandemic had affected their ability to find work. Record numbers of Americans were thrust into poverty. Although Congress approved modest stimulus payments and expansions to unemployment benefits, in summer 2020, over 17% of Americans and 21% of children were living under the federal poverty line. For a family of four, that means living on less than $26,200 a year. The pandemic hasn't been easy on anyone, but for people in society who are already facing structural challenges like racism, sexism, generational poverty, chronic illness, ableism, the challenges have been compounded. Job losses haven't been distributed evenly. The service and entertainment sectors were hit particularly hard. Job losses were highest among women, especially Black and Hispanic women, many of whom work in the worst affected industries. People who are non-white, people under age 30, and those without a college degree. Even after some economic gains, unemployment remains higher for Hispanic, Black, and Asian Americans than it is for white Americans. And record numbers of women left the workforce during the pandemic, nearly 3 million in the last year. Many left because they were overburdened by the demands of providing childcare or other family support. Even before the pandemic, women did more than twice as much unpaid care as men, and the pandemic only worsened this. Leaving the workforce can mean limited opportunities for the rest of a person's career, meaning the effects of the recession could last a lifetime for those who had to stop working. And that's just unemployment. Working Americans are struggling too. 40% of US workers earn less than $15 an hour. Around a quarter of Americans don't get any paid sick leave. 45% have no or inadequate health insurance, and very few have paid family leave to care for the sick and dying. Many people who lost full-time jobs have had to cobble together part-time work with no benefits or security. This can mean working night shifts or unpredictable schedules, both of which can compromise physical and mental health. Even people who have been able to continue their jobs from home are having to renegotiate the boundaries between their personal and work lives. In families with school-aged children attending remote classes while parents are working from home, this can mean that not everyone has access to the devices or bandwidth they need to attend school or work. Working from home can also make it challenging to find privacy and quiet. This can have ramifications when employees or job candidates are expected to appear on video calls. Not everyone has access to a quiet space with a so-called professional background. If someone is taking a job interview or a work meeting from home and there's background noise or other distractions, particularly if their identity means they're already fighting an uphill battle against negative stereotypes, that can introduce more opportunity for the biases of others to affect their prospects. While teleworking has become more common, there are many professions where there's been a constant demand for in-person labor. Healthcare, funeral service, groceries, agriculture, food processing and food service, delivery and logistics, manufacturing, the industries that employ essential workers, might have had continuous or even increased demands for labor, but the working conditions changed, sometimes in dangerous ways. Outbreaks of COVID-19 at food processing sites were common over the past year. Nearly 5,000 cases of COVID-19 were reported across 19 states at meat and poultry processing facilities. According to a study by UCSF, line cooks have had the highest risk of mortality during the pandemic. Cooks, warehouse workers, bakery workers, agricultural workers, and construction workers all faced mortality rates that increased by more than 50%. These essential jobs are high risk and not always well compensated. Despite understanding the risks involved in these roles, some corporations failed to support their workers. Amazon was fined for safety violations that put warehouse workers at greater risks during the pandemic. At Tyson Foods, managers were suspended for betting on how many workers would contract COVID. 
Unions in different sectors, such as transportation and food, have advocated for greater safety measures and paid time off. But many workers don't have access to collective bargaining. And people who are paid under the table, or who take extra legal or illegal jobs like sex work, are especially vulnerable to exploitation and poor working conditions. Even for workers with good pay and benefits, like nurses and doctors, the psychological trauma of COVID-19 has been immense. Healthcare workers are struggling with stress, exhaustion, and grief. The variety of jobs carried out by essential workers illustrates how interdependent our society is. Many essential workers are in jobs that are sometimes unfairly called unskilled or low skill, like delivery drivers, warehouse workers, and food service workers. But let's think about that. One highly respected type of essential worker is a doctor. It's easy for people to admire doctors for their intelligence and skill and for the years of training it takes for them to do their jobs. But doctors don't get there alone. For doctors to do their jobs, they need technical support from nurses and hospital staff. They need moral support from friends, family, and mental health professionals. They need education and training from teachers, professors, researchers, and authors. The instruments and facilities they use are designed by engineers and architects and are maintained by industrial hygienists, sanitation, and maintenance workers. Critical supplies are produced by manufacturers and shipped by logistics and delivery workers. Their clinics run because of the support of healthcare administrative staff who use software supplied by IT companies. And doctors stay on their feet because of meals prepared in restaurants, cafeterias, or a kitchen at home made of ingredients that had to be stocked by grocery workers, produced by food processing workers, and harvested by farm workers. All these professionals contribute something essential to the work of this doctor and the doctor to them. Everyone needs and deserves protection and dignity, no matter whether they work or what they do for a living. When we respond to the economic consequences of the pandemic, we need to make sure we prioritize lifting up those who need the most. There's an old saying that a rising tide will lift all boats. But if you've been hanging onto a piece of driftwood this whole time, that's not good enough. The well-being of our entire society depends on protecting everyone. Everyone's work and everyone's health is interconnected. On that note, we want to wish everyone a happy National Public Health Week. We'll see you next time.